the more you talk and then communicate and, you know, all the management systems in the world can't replace, I think, open, candid dialogue with the people you work with. In this episode of Investors and Operators, we're talking about value creation, operating systems, and trends in healthcare and life sciences. My guest is Matt Jenkins, the man, the myth, the legend at QHP Capital, because he is he's producing some strong content out there. Um, he's a partner at QHP Capital, which is a 51 Labs client. Uh, they're a private equity firm based in North Carolina. It's really focused on tech-enabled healthcare services. QHP has uh, around $2.7 billion uh, under management, investing out of a $500 million fund too, and manages, I think it's nine portfolio companies that are active. Uh, Matt sits on five boards and has a lot on the plate. Matt, mm -hmm. where do we start? Maybe we'll start with, you recently did the management system install with uh, one of the Porco's applied stem cell. Uh, which we've shot a bunch of content with. I, I just kind of love to hear your fresh take on on that experience for the week and maybe kind of laying the ground, like what is the management system install and just kind of going through your your thoughts on how that week went. Yeah, well, well, first off, thank you, Jordan, and your team for for all the help that you've given us. Um, you know, some of the videos you shot out at Applied Stem Cell were, were great. We've shown them to the company and, and a bunch of our stakeholders and, and couldn't be happier with, with how some of those turned out, as I was telling you. Um, yeah, so so a, a couple of things, I think, about the management system install. You know, as you know from your other uh, interviews and, and blogs, it's something we do at QHP in all of our portfolio companies. And sometimes for logistical reasons, we end up doing it maybe six months into, you know, the transaction. Other times we try to do it up front. And, um, you know, I would say in general, we, we're always happier when we do it sooner versus later. And the reason for that is it, it tends to get everybody aligned on the goals and things we want to accomplish together right out of the gate. And there's always, you know, a honeymoon period between the portfolio company and private equity right after you do a deal where everyone's trying to kind of figure out how to work together in this new environment and how to partner. And for us, the management system is a way of kind of really accelerating all of that and getting everybody together to figure out, you know, how we're going to work together. I, um, you know, I did my first management system install, if you want to call it that, with with Vern, my partner, about 15 years ago. And, and I joke, you know, it was kind of like version 1.0 of the Apple operating system in 2007. And now, <laughs> now we're up to like version iOS 17 or something like that. So we've, we've managed to make it a little bit better and tweak it along the way. And, you know, in the early days, we were, um, you know, we were really uh, coming up with all this stuff from scratch, right? We were inventing this stuff kind of on the fly. Now, after years and years of, of deploying it and, and de working with it across our portfolio, we're able to reuse a lot. And I think that the portfolio companies get the benefit of that. So, you know, what used to take five days is it now takes four and we're able to automate a lot of things and, and help the companies and make it a more, you know, rewarding, valuable experience for them. But anyway, as, as it applies to ASC, we, we closed the deal, as you know, back in October of last year. And I think right out of the gate, um, we were anxious to get the management system installed. And one of the big challenges we had uh, was really around at what point do we feel like we've got enough team in place or critical people to make it meaningful. And, you know, we don't want to spend a week and all the time and energy and then you hire 10 new people and you have to go back and, and do it all over again. So we um, we actually started working with the CEO and founder to recruit the executive management team early on right out of the gate after we closed the deal and spent the last quarter of the year bringing on a new chief commercial officer, a CFO, and a new COO. And as soon as we had all those offers locked up and the start dates all finalized, we kind of scheduled the management system offsite in um, in January. And so we we ended up spending a week together, you know, at the company. And and I got to tell you, out of all the experience I've had, this one was one of the best. Honestly, it was one of the best, smoothest you know, times we've ever done it. And I think, I think that's, you know, there's, there's a couple of dimensions to that. One is when you have a smaller group of maybe 20 people, you know, it allows for a little bit different type of dialogue and people work together a little bit smoother. 
Uh, we had a lot of knowledge reuse. We were able to bring the company, you know, that they had the benefit from across other groups. And, um, you know, I also think, too, that sometimes certain cultures take to it. You know, the management system for us is very much about getting people aligned around goals and objectives and roles and responsibility and getting clarity around what we want to do. And the culture at ASC was really receptive to that. Like they wanted that framework and they were scientists and data data driven people. And so I think when they got exposed to it, it, um, you know, it resonated with them right out of the gate. Yeah. What type of prep work did the management team have to do ahead of it? For example, did they have to read getting the right things done? <laughs> did they have to read Vern's upcoming book? Uh, what did they have to do ahead of time to really kind of enter that week and be effective? And what would you recommend other firms do so that when they do similar offsites, that their teams can be up and going as fast as possible? Well, we, we there was a couple of things. One is when we were... Um, in the pre-close phase with ASC, we, we exposed them a little bit to the management system. And then I was out visiting with the team um, at the end of last year and had a chance to meet with the senior team. And I kind of took them through what I call the what to expect when you're expecting version of it. And, um, you know, if you ever read the book, it's kind of like, here's what, what life's going to be like when you're pregnant. And I kind of have the, the version of this is what they expect when you go through the, the offside. I, I have a the, four and a seven-year-old and Matt, I did read the cover. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but it helps. And so, you know, I take everyone through kind of the general idea of the week and what we do and what you expect the outputs of it to demystify it a little bit for everybody. And in terms of prep work, we don't, we don't ask for a whole lot. Um, we facilitate that through the week. And it's it's really part of the secret sauce is getting people to co-create that content together, um, which makes it stick and makes it just yeah. better. I think when you have the team produce things and, uh, you know, as, a, as yeah. a team, uh, we do have everybody read the book and the book is, you know, what I would call some very foundational exposure to the concepts around lean banking, lean manufacturing, uh, lean Six Sigma. So we give that out to everybody at, uh, you know, well in advance, all the participants and ask them to read the book. Um, and then when they come to the meeting, we really have our own kind of agenda on how we facilitate working them through all the things, the work we need to get done over the week. How, how does the week actually break down? What's the 80, 20 of the week that people kind of take away from this and how to think about their own management offsites? Yeah, we um we start at a, you know, believe it or not, at a very basic level where we, you know, we kick off by usually having the founder and the CEO talk about their vision for the company, why they selected a partner, why they selected QHP, you know, in into the process. And both of us kind of in front of everyone talk about why we got together as, as a private equity owner and as a company. And then we always talk about the aspirational goals. Where does the business want to be in three years? And where does the founder or the CEO want to take the company over the next kind of horizon? Not just over the next 12 months, but over the next three to five years. And I think through that discussion, everybody quickly becomes attuned to the fact that the goals that everyone has together, the shared goals for what they want the company to be over three to five years are ambitious. I mean, they're ambitious strategically, personally, financially, um, across all these dimensions. And that really that creates the impetus for why they have to change, why we have to do things differently, why we have to put new processes in place, why we have to think about the business being managed in a different way for us all to accomplish those goals and do something that that is fairly aspirational. Um, we then, you know, take a lot of time defining the mission and vision of the business, making sure everybody is comfortable with that. We look at the marketplace and really talk about why the company exists and how we're different than any other of the competitors in the marketplace. And then we spend a day or two really deconstructing the organization and breaking it down to where it's not about people's names and org charts or where they sit in the org chart or who does what, but really thinking about how work gets done. You know, For us to get to a product or a service or output, Think about it as a factory and let's really deconstruct what we do into the most basic fundamental steps so everyone understands the core work from soup to nuts, from end to end that gets done and us delivering value to clients. Yeah. And we and I, then, once we tear it all apart, we spend time then kind of rebuilding the org into 
roles and responsibilities and thinking about who does what and how those jobs are resourced. And by going through that process, we're, we're essentially building the organization to scale to do something that it's never fundamentally done before. That's really interesting. And it makes me think back to the conversation I had with Ruby on our blog when she was discussing how Vern fell on the ground when he was asking, you know, who's responsible for revenue? And it's almost like, is this a trick question? You know, salespeople, like, you know, that slash CEOs. And he's like, no, <laughs> it's the people doing the work, <laughs> executing and actually delivering the product and service. Um, and one of the other takeaways from that conversation was how she felt it was quite illuminating to see how much she was doing across the entire business and how much she should not be doing. <laughs> and it kind of leads me into this question of how do founders like Jing and I evolve from doing all of the work to truly being that next level manager of a business and developing that skill set, how do they successfully grow from that founder CEO to being a good CEO and manager? Yeah, there's there's a lot to unpack in that that question. We could spend an entire day on that, but let me let me give you a couple of thoughts on it. It's a really tough tough question. Um, that takes a lot of trial and error mistakes to kind of really figure out how to do it. But, you know, I think, I, I think you got to first, you got to understand what you're dealing with when you come into a company as a private equity investor. And, you know, we're, we're in that business because something is obviously going right, you know, <laughs> that, that we're attracted to it. And these companies have usually been built by some of the most extraordinary, talented, brilliant, hardworking people on, on the planet that, you know, spend 20 hours a day and have the work ethic and the passion and the intellectual ability to build something, uh, you know, that that is phenomenal. And so, you know, when you come into that situation, you're not coming into it with the framework of something is broken or something's not working right or somebody's doing something wrong. You're coming into it from the framework of like, you've done great. Now, what do we need to change to be able to get to that next plateau? What do we want to keep? What do we want to do differently? And usually what you find when you go through the teardown of roles and responsibilities is founders in general have been successful because their talent and fingerprints have been on every decision in the business. That is not uncommon. I'm sure it's the same for 51 labs, you know? Yeah, I mean, like if we just look at the content we do for you, like we look at every single video, every single post. And then now we have Grace who's been staffed on it. And then Grace plus another colleague who's staffed on it. And then, but we still have to like actively have these check-in points at defined times during a video production process to make sure it's still getting the industry insights. Like I did banking for seven, for six years. Jing did law for seven years. We've been in the industry for 15. We're just going to know more things that we got to make yeah. sure is getting the quality that the clients expect and that we need to deliver, but also balancing that with the team wants to execute autonomously. Well, so I think there's there's a lot there's a lot there. One, I think your teams and the teams we come into want to please the founder and the owner of the business, right? Like they're in there, they want to do a good job. And so a lot of times the roles and responsibilities and what they're empowered to make decisions on is never really formalized. Like there may be an informal unspoken thing between you and your teams and we find with the teams but have you ever taken the time to really define and put it down on paper and say, this is what I'm going to make decisions on. And this is what you're free to make decisions on. That's something we do. And when, when you've heard from some of our clients and portfolio companies that it's illuminating, I think it's because it forces them to really think, do I need to be in all these decisions? And where can I add the most value? And given that we're going to three X the revenues in this company over three years, where should I spend the 20 hours of work every day that I'm willing to put into this? And so we watch uh, those executives over the course of the week, and they always go through a little bit of this thinking, like, it, you're telling me it's okay. I thought you were going to tell me to work harder as the private equity owner and do more. And you're telling me that it's actually, you want me to do the opposite. You want me to take hands off the wheel a little bit and let people make those decisions. 
And it's a little bit of a rewiring process that they go through because it's so counterintuitive to how they've made the business successful. But for us, it's like we're trying to get the most skill and the most capacity out of every single person in that organization and every function. We're trying to move really, really quick with like really high velocity. And you can't do that unless you have those roles and responsibilities and decision making rights really, really well articulated. And I think it gives them, when you put it down in writing, it gives the CEO or the founder a chance for you, Jordan, to say, no, 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 I got to be involved. And every time a video goes out the door, or you might say, eh, eh, I'll measure, I'll measure quality in some other way. Maybe it's from feedback from my clients or whatever the case is, but I'll, I'll let the staff kind of go and, and make those decisions themselves. Yeah, it's almost like on that roles and responsibilities exercise, the, the, a simple way to say is like, do this, don't do that. And here's the list of those things. And it is so hard to pull back because that energy across every single part of the business is what got it to where it's at, but is not going to get it to where it's going. Well, and that's, that's, it's so true because I mean, that phrase gets thrown around a lot, right? Like what made you... What got you here is not going to get you there. It's a, it's a very trite phrase, but it's so true when you actually break down the actual mechanics of, of that organizationally and you really think about, you know, what it takes to scale a business. I mean, when you're talking about growing revenues by three or four times in three years and you really sit down and think about what that means in terms of hiring and pace and number of transactions it, you're going to have to get efficiencies out of the organization and you're going to have to delegate scale and empower people to be able to do that. There's just no other yeah. way. Let, let's shift over to mission and vision. So we now have pretty clear values of our organization. It only took six years of iterating it <laughs> late nights and on the bike and thinking about our values. Uh, we have a really clear vision about what we're trying to build going from, all right, we're originally starting of just being good at LinkedIn posts. And now we do videos. Now we do websites. Now the vision is super clear of what we want to be is that one-stop shop just within private equity and, and kind of like opportunistically credit or opportunistically hedge funds adventure. But um, what we kind of been struggling with is purpose mission. Like, you know, we're not SpaceX going to Mars and trying to be an interplanetary species you know, the, how in the heck do you create a vision for a business that motivates the team? And what does the, what does the mission and purpose actually mean? Here's our current mission, like to revolutionize private equity marketing and develop meaningful relationships along the journey. Oh, That's kind of where we're initially at, but this is like version three or four. <laughs> we keep on coming back to it every Monday. Like, guys, oh, we know our vision, we know our values, but what is our actual mission and purpose? So how do you think about guiding your portfolio companies with mission and purpose? Um, that's a, it's a great question. It's a hard one. And it's one that we tackle at the beginning of every single offsite of the management system. This is where we start. Um, I think... So there's a couple of things. I think that what we find, I, I'm always surprised, you know, usually the mission and vision, and I don't know how it is for, for your company, but a lot of times that's been built at a founder or CEO's desk with very little input from everybody. That's just the nature of things. Um, occasionally we run into companies where there's been more than the founder or the CEO that have put it together. We we get everybody at the offsite into that to that discussion to recreate it. And we do it for obvious reasons, right? You want it to be something that everybody feels as durable and that they're bought into before we move to the next phase of work. Um, you know, I can tell you a lot of times we struggle with how to A, make it something that doesn't sound like a hundred other companies and make it really, really unique to that particular business. And we also struggle how to distill it down to as few as words as possible few impactful words versus a paragraph. And, you know, we show our companies, to answer your question, we show examples from leading companies when we get out there and we walk them through the different styles. And we make the point that no style, you can be Chick-fil-A and it feels very different than Southwest Airlines versus Disney. 
you know, these are very different mission and, um, you know, vision statements and how they construct it. All very successful companies. And so we try to get the, the companies to decide what flavor is right for them and try to make it very, very unique and tailored to them. And it's not often, uh, I can tell you that it's starting to become more the norm that we started out and we do it and everyone's like, that's great. And you get the, that's on a Monday. And then by Wednesday, we're like, yeah, can we go back and look at that? Like we've done two days work and the team feels that we need to take another crack at it and rework it. And so I think that um, usually what ends up happening, if we go back for the second pass, it becomes a lot crisper, a lot cleaner, a lot more tailored for that particular company. Um, you know, I don't know if, if Ruby shared with you the story, but when we did the mission and vision and values for, uh, for ASC, the offsite we did a couple of weeks ago, it was really, really good. And the team was really engaged and she was great and, and the team was doing a great job. And then we had this list of values that was just like this laundry list, right? And it was very, it, it, they meant it, but it also felt like everybody else that you had. And we pulled it back up 48 hours into us working together and, and tried to test to see who remember what. And of course, everybody couldn't really remember the details because the list was so big. So we pulled it back out and the team actually came up with values that mapped to the term IPSCs. And you yep. know, when Ruby took That's that good. back to the team, everybody could relate to that and understood what IPSCs meant and the values associated with each of those letters. So that worked for them great. And it was something that was really, you know, embraced by the team and everybody knew. And, you know, it'll probably stick around for some time. So how do you reconcile? Um, actually, for some context, I've been rereading Atomic Habits and you know, there's some other people who kind of write about this idea of like, don't be focused on goals, be focused on systems and processes. Uh, I think the Scott Adams, the Dilbert author kind of popularized that, that idea as well. And I was wondering kind of how an you, engineer, wasn't he? by training, I don't know in his life. I think he was an engineer. There we I go. <laughs> That's why we're getting, okay. That makes sense now. And I'm just kind of curious how you kind of balance and reconcile being focused on goals, which is an in state with revenue goals, for example, and just focusing on doing the right things every day, every week, every month, the habits, the systems, the processes, focus on that. Don't focus on the actual end goal of a three year revenue goal. How do you kind of balance these things? Because you do also do have, you know, you need to sell the business as you're in the business of buying, growing, and selling. Uh, that that is a great question. Well, one, we um our management system philosophy is in just the way we interact with companies, we don't come in and implement processes and say this is how you're going to, you know, here's the detailed process flow for how you shall deliver customer service or you know, route route a product to market or build a product. We've got ideas and best practice we we share but we're never focused on that. Our management system is 100% focused on trying to figure out goals at the company level, goals at the department level, and goals at the individual level that all complement and reinforce each other to get to that design state. And the philosophy behind it is if you have shared alignment and objectives and goals and really across your organization, then how you go about doing the work becomes a lot easier to collaborate and build those shared systems and build those shared processes and lay in the, you know, the infrastructure for how you're actually going to deliver that in a collaborative way. But for us, you know, a process that doesn't deliver an output is not a very good, you know, it's not a very good system, right? And so we're very much start with the end in mind and work backwards from there. We, you know, all of our, um, all of our companies have goals that we call true north at the company level that are usually financial and some operational. And we've got a blend of operational and, and strategic goals, both at the one year and three year mark that kind of permeate all levels of our portfolio companies. Now, how you balance that? Like, well, if you're not meeting your goals, then, you know, our system that's rooted in Six Sigma methodology requires you to go look at the root causes for why that didn't happen and put the right 
corrective measures and steps in place to get back on track or plan. But, um, you know, there's a reason why you put processes in place and there's a reason why you design work a certain way and it should be able to get the output that you, you know, you're striving to get. Yeah, I, I think it's a good idea and concept to be focused on, you know, just show up to the gym 30 minutes a day. Don't worry about getting abs. They'll come just do the work every 30 minutes a day. But I, I think practically speaking, there's a balance of you have to have a direction and goals and accountabilities. What do you think is the most difficult thing for portfolio companies to work through with the management system? Um, I think that part, part of it is, um, I, I think there's two things. I think that the management system puts plans in place those plans are expressed as metrics and goals, right? And it's a plan. And I think a lot of folks realize that if you're if you're not meeting the metric or you're below, you know, whatever it is or something's off, they have to shift their thinking from, you know, from I'm doing a bad job to let me dig into why that is happening. And what are the root causes behind it? And really understand what are the reasons driving that variance. And, you know, a plan is a plan, right? Like you put plans in place, things go awry. We're human beings. We live in an uncertain world. Sometimes they end up better. Sometimes they end up worse. But the reason we set these goals is so that you can, you know, scientifically and very methodically figure out the levers in your business that are under your control to, to be able to enact change to deliver the output. And that shift in thinking of I'm running a production line versus I'm just at the whim of whatever happens, but I can control my own destiny and pull levers and figure out creative ways to be able to get my production line back online or, or serve the goals is a mindset change for a lot of people. And there are some folks that never really have been exposed to root cause analysis to think through you know, why, why something is really not working systemically. Is it in my control or someone else's, or is it, you know, what, what's the real factor that's causing something to not go the way I planned it to go. And for us to kind of really train the companies to think about it and then think about, okay, fine, something's off track. Now, how are you going to, what actions and things are you going to take to be able to, to, to fight it and be able to get the production line back on track? So that, that kind of thinking is different for a lot of companies and it's empowering for a lot of people. A lot of people love it, right? Because it's liberating to be taught, this is in my control, these are my goals, I'm empowered, I'm gonna go fix the problem. A lot of folks resonate really well with that. Um, there, are some, there are some folks that just don't see the world quite in that kind of framework. And it takes some time for them to understand, to do root cause analysis and to reflect on what they could have done better or reflect on the help they need or think about plans that can like, you know, move the needle from 5 million to 15 million, you know, and think about that logically, how to pull it. That is a, that takes a little bit of time and, and it has very little to do with how smart they are or how experienced the managers. It's a mindset. I think that we try to, we try to help people and coach them through. Let's talk about letting go. You've been around a lot of founders and I'm just kind of curious how effective founders let go and are able to evolve to that next stage of the business with a partner. We have considered, do we even want to sell this business, 51 Labs? Like, I don't, I don't know. I kind of like the family life. I kind of like this integration of business and family and all the other stuff that we do. And it just kind of made us think about if, when, and how do we let go? I know that I struggle with being able to control different parts of the business, different parts of a project. So just I'm curious to understand all the founders you have seen, who has effectively done that and how did they kind of manage that process? Well, there was this, there was this book and, and I remember going to a M&A you know, conference years ago. 
and I was talking about founders and lower middle markets. And there was some research done on this. Uh, it won't surprise you. And basically, the story the story that was told to me that I share with other people, they went out and they looked at what what kind of profiles there are of founders who build businesses. And they fall into basically three categories, segments. There are founders who build their companies because they don't want to be, a, they, I mean, they don't want to be an employee to someone else. They want to be the boss, control their own destiny. You remind me a little bit about that. You want to control your own destiny and, and, and that. There are the folks out there that really have a passion for what they do, and they want to produce the highest quality product or service that they can. And those are more of your, you know, tradesmen, artists, doctors sometimes, but it's like you want to practice what you do and you want to do it your way and you want to do a really tight job. Then there is the third category, and those are the people that just want to scale. They don't care. They want a big, financially successful business, and they want to scale it, and they have big hopes and dreams. And, you know, believe it or not, that third category is rare. And yet those are the people that private equity wants to invest in, because those are the easiest to make that transition, you know, in all of it. And I think a lot of times the founder, um, particularly when you're investing in healthcare and life sciences businesses, the founders are people who are used to being very successful in their domains. They were the straight A students. They were the top of their class. And it takes, it is a different skill set to be a CEO in a private equity portfolio company. It is a different discipline. It's a different role. It's a different skill set. And I think the folks that are really good at understanding that transition are the folks that are, you know, self-aware enough to think about why did they start the business? Maybe which category do they really fall in? What do they love doing? And do they truly recognize that the CEO role is a very unique, different role with a different skill set that is not about how smart you are or how hardworking you are, but it's just a different functional skill set to do it. And I think those folks that can kind of put those pieces together and see it are the ones that are the most adaptable folks that are good at letting go and, and moving forward. I'm sure you've had a fair amount of difficult discussions with founders or people who've been in the business at a senior level for a long time. How, how do you approach those difficult discuss discussions? Well, I think, I think, you know, one, one, you have to, you have to have to um, truly, truly respect what they built. If, if you don't, you shouldn't be in my role. You know, you have no business being in. You have to understand all the success that they've created and all the things that they did to get their business to where they were and really have a deep admiration and, and appreciation for it. And then you need to be able to articulate the role of the CEO and whether or not that's really what someone wants to be happy in this world. And, you know, it's a tough job, I think. And a lot of times what people think the CEO job is versus what it is can be completely two, two different things. And, you know, I think the founders that, um, the founders that got into the business because they wanted to be the boss and their own boss get into CEO roles. And now all of a sudden they've got boards and they've got reporting and they've got employees to manage and all this. And it doesn't feel like it was why they originally started it to begin with, or that they find themselves consumed with tasks that they're not really happy doing, you know, all day long. They're managing people or reports or or doing something that isn't why they started the business to begin with. And so I think, I think, and again, this is a this is a journey for me too, you know, along the way. But I think it's about trying to figure out what makes people motivated and happy and what they enjoy doing and helping people understand that there's so many ways that they can create value. Sometimes the CEO rolls the right way, and sometimes it's a different role that they flourish in, that they love. And um, I think trying to understand what motivates and drives people is a big is a big factor in this. Let's talk about your journey as a board member and investor. What has your path been like and what's the difference between you today as a board member and investor and maybe 10 plus years ago and when you're really kind of starting down this journey? Um, 
I think uh, 10 years ago, I, I, I made the assumption that everyone saw things the same way I did. And that's a very dangerous assumption. And, you know, if you think the market is a certain way, or you think that the priorities in the business a certain way, and you keep that to yourself and you think everybody else gets it, then they probably don't. And so I think I now try to over communicate on how I'm thinking about things and how I'm seeing things so I can bounce that off folks to see if it, if it resonates, if they agree with me or, or not. And the more you talk and then communicate and, you know, all the management systems in the world can't replace, I think, open, candid dialogue with the people you work with. I mean, you know, I'm technically in finance. Finance is a small part of my job compared to like everything else that you have to do. And um, I try to engage people in the most like candid, direct way I possibly can so that they understand where we're both coming from on things and we can see if we're aligned or not. Um you know, I also believe in over communicating on things. You know, I think years ago, you know, 10 years ago, um, we might have an initiative and we do it once and then it goes in the drawer and I don't bring it out and continue to kind of reinforce and bring it on. And you have to have the discipline to keep beating the same issues and things, even if they get bored with you to, to get them to a point where you feel like you've accomplished your goal. And I think, you know, now as a board member, I, I really sit back and I, I, you know, I try to look for ways where I can really help. And I joke with all of our portfolio companies, the kind of bad help I've seen private equity investors give, and they all show up and they're like, we're here to help. And help means a lot of different things in this business. And I, I, I openly talk about this and share examples with folks. But when we come to the table, when I come to the table, I'm, I'm really thinking about if I was in their shoes, what would be perceived as a thank you? You really helped me out this day. You did something I didn't have the time to do or have a value on. And I appreciate the partnership. Um, you know, I try to approach those situations like that. What is one of the most painful times as a board member when it was like, this was actually my fault? And uh -huh. my fault. And you're like, <laughs> wow. This is painful, but maybe, you know, a few years later, realize that it was actually quite formative. Um, I, <laughs> that's a tough one. Um, I've never, I've never met a colleague in private equity that ever says, man, I messed up on the investment thesis on this deal. Like, I mean, I'm sure there's somebody out there somewhere on planet Earth that says that, but I just haven't run into them in 20 years. So I think I think um, there's a tendency to, to say, I always had the right idea and, you know, the team couldn't execute, right? That is that is very, very pervasive thinking in, in our industry. But sometimes I think you have to be, reflective enough to go back and say, listen, I had an idea on this and the assumptions weren't that right. And we can, we can pivot away from it. And that's tough to do, right? I think that you've got to create a culture where, you know, people try, they try new things, they learn, they fail. It's okay. Um, that is easier said than done. Right. And if you can really build a culture where people can say, you know what, I tried it, it didn't work out. I'm on to the next thing. You're, you're going to go through that cycle so much faster and you're going to learn, and you're going to get better and you're going to iterate so many times and experiment and take risk and go things. And that is a tough, tough culture to implement. And, and it's got to start almost with the board member, you know, to find an opportunity to say, hey, we tried four or five things. That was a bad idea. Number three was a bad idea. I shouldn't have done it. It was awful. We're not going to do that again. But you don't get a lot of that you don't get a lot of that in, in, you know, in our industry, unfortunately. Yeah. It, it's interesting. Cause I, I, I have a journal and I just have a long list of <laughs> management lessons, <laughs> discussion topics. And I, I think, you know, for, 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 for me, it's recently been like, what is my job? Am I doing my job today? And right now it's shifted to, majority of my day needs to be sales and marketing where in a given month, our overheads 80 to 90,000. We didn't have 80 or 90,000 of expenses. Like our sales weren't that last year. 
And like, no, my job is not looking at this video. My job is not looking at this post. My job is not re reviewing this part of a project. Like my job is like, I got to keep the lights on. And now we have seven full-time employees. And so it's been that shift in creating those barriers and finding that balance of when to train versus when to do the actual work. And then shifting over to just doing my job. Well, I think I think I think something else I remind myself too. And this 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 little nugget I think will, you know, give you great, great comfort as it, it's given me comfort. But you know, I used to read when I was younger, you know, 20 years ago, I, I would read kind of all the management articles and books I could possibly get my hands on, right? Like I just absorbed that stuff. Vacation reading, you know, plane reading, anytime I could. And a lot of times the people that are put up on that pedestal are the folks that are, you know, very successful people. And one day it kind of clicked on me that, you know, the best managers are not necessarily the folks that are like on a fast ticket rocket because they've caught some meteor. It's the folks that are dealing with like gnarly, nasty situations and are adept about steering the ship around icebergs, right? And it occurred to me that like, we tend to put the managers up on on pedestals and success that that kind of have it easy, frankly. And to me, the really, really good managers in business, the good operators, the good board members are those folks that don't lose it the minute that numbers come off the, the, the rails or that you're in a crisis situation. And the folks that are really good at managing through adversity and not immediately, you know, losing their head or destabilizing or blaming people, but attacking the issues and finding solutions. That's what I want to be. You know, I want to be when the when the bullets start flying and flames start going that I'm cool and I figure out ways to work and solve problems and come up with innovative solutions, not not to where, you know, oh, my God, we're like off plan and, you know, the, everything easy. And I think it's really easy to be, um, you know, it's easy to be an easy CEO when things are good. But how are you going to how are you going to cope with those downturns and those bad times and the issues? I think that's what separates good board members and good investors and good CEOs from everyone else. If you're on, you know, a rocket ship blowing up and the business is growing and, you know, it, and there's never any problem. If you're lucky enough to be somebody like that, then all power to you. But I don't know if those are necessarily the best, you know, the best executives. Kind of shifting gears a little bit. There might be some younger professionals who are listening to this, maybe in their second year of banking or doing their MBA programs, or maybe they're a first year associate at a private equity firm. Like what are some generalizations and some good advice for them who are earlier in their career on what to focus on, what not to focus on, and just on how they might, uh, what are some effective principles to think about the next kind of five plus years? It's a, it's a tough question. You know, one one thing I notice a lot with um, with with younger staff, particularly in some of the, the career disciplines you just mentioned, private equity and banking and all this, is they tend to think of their career in a very linear fashion. I'm going to do two years and then I'm going to do three years and I'm going to do this role and this role. And life does not work that way. And you know, I, I don't think that uh, many careers do. I mean, there may be, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's progressions and people that go through that process. But I think that, um, and, and I coach our, our team all the time on that, to think about that is that your career is only about making the next level in a specific, specific time horizon or following a formula, I think is a very bad idea because things come up. You know, life deals you different twists and turns. And I think that if you find, you know, if you're lucky enough to focus in on what you're good at and what you have a passion for and what gets you up in the morning, then the career stuff tends to have a way of working itself out. And even if you don't get the next promotion you want or the next job you want, I think that if you have a passion for what you do and you're good at it and those things intersect, then the people around you are going to create opportunities for you. Your network is going to grow. People are going to remember you. You're going to find ways to advance your career that you didn't really see at the time, but are theirs later. And, you know, I think back about my relationships and, you know, I've got a lot of lasting relationships of people that I've worked with for 20 years that we still work together and think about. 
And, you know, I think that um, I, I now look at that and I value the relationships and the human relationships a lot more than I did when I was younger. I just didn't realize I was cultivating those, you know, for long term. Um, but I think I think thinking about your career is, is too much of a formula and not being opportunistic and dynamic and following nonlinear path is something I is something I talk a lot to the to the team about. Yeah, there there's a book by Cal Newport when he kind of rejects the whole passion hypothesis. And the basic takeaway is it's okay to not know what you like and what you're passionate about. Like just go do something, learn about it. And then you will become passionate as you become competent. <laughs> you will become passionate as sure. others value and you're getting paid for what you're doing. But this kind of idea of start with passion versus, you know, passion is discovered along the way. Well, I don't, you know, I don't know if anybody um, gets up in the morning and says, I have a passion for building the perfect Excel spreadsheet model in an LBO. <laughs> um, we, we love those folks. But I think I think people can have a passion to say, I like being I like doing deals. And there's things about doing deals. I like things I don't. But overall, I get excited about doing deals. Yeah. And I think for me, that was something I, I realized early on that I liked roles that required me to utilize multiple skill sets and tools in the toolbox. And I think that when I felt challenged and that I was, you know, using different attributes and skills as part of my job, I was happier. And that happiness led to better work products and, you know, better relationships. So yeah. I think people need to think about, you know, what drives them and really be reflective of it. And I just talked to a couple of graduate students yesterday um, at one of the MBA schools about this. And they were trying to, I mean, very talented people, but they're all trying to figure out if their next job is going to derail their entire career or not, you know, that they take. And I'm like, hey, man, you got some big decisions, but you're trying to choose between five great opportunities. And, you know, chances are you're only going to be in that job for a few years before you want to try something else. So what's going to be what's going to allow you to grow and develop and have the optionality you want to, to figure these things out? Don't feel like you're signing a life commitment and blood on this. Thing. <laughs> well, shifting over to. Uh, life sciences and healthcare trends. Like what are some of the, I mean, you're on five different boards of portfolio companies, but what are some interesting things that you're seeing maybe with stem cell gene editing or anything else in the portfolio? That's like, this is one of the few things that is going to fundamentally change the way that we live or, um, or how healthcare is done in this country in the next five plus years? Yeah, I, I think um, I would say there's a couple of things that are, are you know, I mean, uh, big. I, I'd say there's two big things that have happened that are foundational to everything else that has come beyond it. One is, you know, for the last, let's call it 20 years, or, you know, you could even pick a point, whether it's the the, the advent widespread proliferation of the internet or mobile phones or social media, you can pick these different inflection points. Um, we've got AI, you know, happening now, but regardless of how you think about it, there has been this massive proliferation of data and, and it, it surrounds us in everything we do. And you got to think most of science and healthcare and life sciences and drug discovery and new products is all based on data analysis. And so for the last several years, there's just so much of it being generated that it, it requires, you know, it's no longer about how do you generate data and capture data. It's about how do you make sense of it and curate it, work with it, turn the data into evidence that can be meaningfully used to evaluate the effectiveness of a drug. So I think just the, the massive, massive, massive proliferation of data is advancing all sorts of different domains in our industry, right? Like all those things are going forward at, at, at high velocity. The other thing that um, that I'll say is, and, and I, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a biologist, but it really feels to me that we're in this kind of golden age of biology. Like some of the advancements that have been made around understanding the human genome understanding, you know, the immunology systems, understanding gene editing, understanding how to interact with cells. These are ridiculously crazy developments in biology that has allowed us to do things with 
you know, with medicine that I think people don't really appreciate. They might hear about it, but they don't understand how we're in this kind of new world order around the science and these breakthroughs. And because of that, um, I think now the industry and just in general, we're trying to struggle on how do you manufacture these things at scale? You know, it's so much more complex than making an aspirin in a factory. But how can you get these therapies out to people that, you know, don't cost a couple million dollars? Or how do you how do you drive scale out of it? You know, scale is about doing one thing to many people. And now if it's one to one, you know, it kind of turns the entire manufacturing facility upside down. So I think we're in this this weird, weird system where where our processes for bringing drugs to market and being able to commercialize them is trying to catch up with the massive amount of data that's being generated and all of these breakthroughs in biology that are allowing us to do new things. And so it's an it's an interesting time, I think, for the industry um, where you're going to see more and more therapies, more and more um, biologics tailored to individual people and rare diseases and specific personalized medicines and how you can you know, get these to the right people at the right time at the right cost is going to be the challenge for us for the next 15 or 20 years. Yeah. And that's just, you know, when you think about applied stem cell and how do you get this instead of one-to-one, how do you have like anybody could be a donor? And then how do you make sure that, you know, when you look at co-pilot that it's getting these really, really rare diseases that they can get the drugs to them. And it's, kind of looking at the whole value chain and then, you know, overall taking a customized approach. And um, it's exciting. I know very little about it. (laughs) Well, and and I think, I think the, um, you know, so much of healthcare and life sciences is driven by, you know, reimbursement and, you know, the government, what the government and insurance pays for things. And so it's a really it's a really interesting industry to work in when the person who gets the benefit of the new drug isn't necessarily always the person who incurs the financial cost of the treatment. And, and you know, the insurance system adds a degree of complexity to healthcare and life sciences that particularly in the United States, that that makes it very, very challenging, you know, makes it very difficult to navigate. How how would you compare? Kind of our ecosystem for healthcare and life sciences versus other countries like Japan or other places in Europe, and just the ecosystem for innovation, funding, and overall getting products and services to market. Well, I think I think um, you know both both Japan as well as uh, Europe and America to cite those three kind of big you know big um, uh, political systems all have very good regulatory bodies. I mean, they have very thoughtful, very good regulatory bodies that that oversee products and services. Um, you know, the U.S. If you just look at the data, I mean, we we have been kind of an innovation leader for a very very long time. And, you know, you just look at the the breakthroughs and the discoveries and what, you know, what we've been able to accomplish and the speed of innovation. And um, the United States has been, you know, significant in that for sure. And a lot of that has come about because of, you know, the investments we've made in science and technology and research has has created a flywheel where, where these advancements have been possible. I think the U.S. in general is unique in the sense that we struggle with a complicated, you know, payer system of private and public insurance, of us trying to figure out how to, you know, create access to health care for, you know, millions of, of Americans, how to keep costs low while spurring innovation and free markets. It, it, we're more complicated than I think those countries that have more of a national health care payer system or more of a nationalistic service. And they tend to be the, the down you know, the beneficiaries of innovations that take place in, in America. Um, I think, you know, healthcare payment reform is really important to continue to think about. And, you know, in this country, I think the, the um, you know, if you just look at where federal assistance goes with the GMP, most people don't realize massive amounts of money and tax dollars goes to Medicare and Medicaid. And, 
you know, for us to be able to continue to find ways of taking care of people that are serviced by those programs and doing it in a, in a way that makes economic sense, it's probably the biggest challenge in healthcare, more so than even some of the technology, you know, and, and you know, technical challenges we face. Yeah. Well, maybe to kind of bring this to a close, if uh, QHP had a theme song or a genre, what would that be? <laughs> I thought of one the other day. Um, theme song. Damn. That's a good one. Um, you know, maybe. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know, man. That was a tough one. I think it was very on, on all of it. Uh, uh, probably a good Phil Collins song. I don't know. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and if you had a personal walkout song, what would that be? Oh man, um, I'd probably have a couple. I think it'd probably be, um, gosh, um, I'm a music lover. I can't. You threw me a curveball on that. I'm trying to think of, of a good one. Um, I don't know. I'd have to think about that. <laughs> All good. You could just record the selfie video, send it to me afterwards. <laughs> That's a tough one. <laughs> My brain's my brain needs to rewire for that one. So, well, we went from uh, a global healthcare regulatory and uh, ecosystems to your walkout songs. Yeah, you need to get here. connected with my Spotify DJ. He'll give you some rather interesting ideas. <laughs> <laughs> it's been awesome. Appreciate you taking the time for this. This has been fantastic. Oh, thanks, Jordan. I appreciate it, and thanks again for everything you guys have done. <laughs>